everyone. It's so nice to meet you, and it's an honor to be on SUU campus today. Thank you so much, Tyler, for the kind introduction. Okay, I want to start off to, and learn a little bit more about you. Obviously, you all are students, but I'm just curious how many of you have interest on running your own business one day? Please share your hands. Holy cow, does this just fill my heart with glee. Okay, how many of y'all uh, are uh, children or related to individuals who started their own business? Ra please raise your hand. Now, I know this can be like a mixed bag, but keep your hand up if you thought that they had a really good experience. Awesome. And let's be honest, how many of you thought they had a difficult experience? Yes, thank you for being honest. Oftentimes, difficulty when it comes to entrepreneurism uh, usually evolves around money, right? Yeah. It takes money to make money. Who's heard of that phrase? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, entrepreneurs are usually those that are most creative problem solving, that look at the world differently, that color things yellow when it should be only in black and white, and it really does drive our society as well as our free markets. Yet one of the things that just really are not an innate sense of learning is how to get money and run that money into your business so that you can make it scalable. Fun fact, there are 89,000 women entrepreneurs here in this great state of Utah. Pretty amazing, right? <laughs> that number doubled since 1975, and so we've done a great job on blowing up our entrepreneurism as well as helping women create businesses of their own. But here's a problem that we have in this state. Almost half of them are solopreneurs. So what this means is that all they are doing is employing themselves and not really creating a scalable business. In fact, just two weeks ago, NerdWallet created a report uh, that they do every year that ranked Utah 49th for women entrepreneurs in this state, and one of the problems is access to capital. That is why I am here today. That is why I'm just honored that Tyler invited me to speak to you all, because this has been my passion for over 20 years. I know I look 29, but I'm not. <laughs> uh, but it's just access to capital. And for everyone in this room, especially those who are minorities, marginalized, or women, I challenge you to stretch yourself a little bit further. And that's by networking, by asking, by researching, and by approaching capital, because I believe you all are gonna take us from the last rank, last rank state to the top, okay? Let me just do a quick introduction to myself, um, adding on to what Tyler said, which is I run a really cool nonprofit. It's 40 years old, it's around education, about uh, receiving capital from various capital providers. Started off as the Dr. Wayne Brown Institute in 1983 out of the University of Utah. Uh, as Tyler have mentioned, we've helped just thousands of companies. Uh, last year, we acquired or was donated the Boom Startup Accelerator, where I was executive director of, and I helped them with pre-seed funding. And then, of course, before that, uh, I ran an incubator called Hen House Ventures back in Silicon Valley, and that was after I had like a really illustrious career in a lot of high-tech enterprise startups. My uh, claim to fame that just kind of made me double down as to why capital is so important is at um, Sugar CRM. How many of you all know open source software? Thank you. Okay, so uh, Sugar CRM was the very first open source application back in the day when PHP 4.0 was released. It was big, big doings, and I was their first employee. I ran marketing, sales, the fax machine. I did the uploads onto what was called SourceForge. All of these things are just antiquated, antiquated relics at this point, but it was absolutely fun, fun because I was there when we closed our Series A, which was our very first investment round of 1.2 million from a little known venture capital group called Draper Fisher Jurvetson. They also invested in Tesla. So uh, it was really fun to be the very first employee of that. 
And that's where I figured out that in getting the right sort of capital it has to be played right for top line growth, meaning you just got to bolster the sales or the reach, et cetera. But then there's a responsibility to your investors to make sure that you're not spending frivolously or that your bottom line is safe for longevity. Outside of that, I did write a book if you want to um, go through the mental process before you start the business. And um, that too is open source under Creative Commons, so you can download it, read it. Uh, there's over 100 different um, uh, resources in there. And then, of course, please link to me in uh, LinkedIn. I live in LinkedIn, and my favorite thing to do is help people like you on your path. I am totally reachable. Um, Connect Capital has one rule of thumb. We make entrepreneurs more investable, and we connect them to capital. And uh, it is a nonprofit of 501c3, so all you need to do is go to connectcapital.org. Our community and impact over the years have been really impressive. Since 2009, when we had our first study done, <coughs> We um, closed one point, our companies have gone through a program, have closed $1.6 billion in investment capital and have generated 10 billion. So that's almost a 10 to one scale. We're very proud of that, especially as a nonprofit. How much cooler would it have been if we had equity in these companies, but that's another story. I just took the reins over in December. 60% um, of our graduating CEOs raise the capital that they need, be it from equity, debt, or non-dilutive, and we'll talk about that, in the trailing 12 months after going through a program. And P.S., our program is free to entrepreneurs to participate in. And then 80% who go through our program are in business 10 years later. We have four categories in our amazing community. We have CEOs and entrepreneurs who need to understand pathways to capital, we have mentors and interns just like you that want to expand their understanding of how entrepreneurism is evolving today. We have capital providers such as VCs, angel investors, family offices, banks, corporate financing group, private equity, who come in because they love our stats. And then of course we have sponsors and donors. And those are the people that allow us to provide these services for free and provide me a salary which I'm appreciative. So everyone's invited, our programs are free, we're accessible to all, we do have a structured mentoring, and we do shared learning and connections. I'm not gonna go through these, but we have amazing programs. And not only are they online, but they're also in person. We have like all this really neat hub and spoke. And we're developing a spoke here in Southern Utah. So expect great things in the next year. The one thing I'd like to plug is that we have an online internship that on average is two hours a week. And it's something that if you want further exposure into the entrepreneurship, we have three different positions. You can find us on Handshake, or you can go to this web page. But it's a wonderful way to just get exposure and to meet investors and, and entrepreneurs. So any other questions about Connect Capital before I go into finding capital? Please raise your hand. Yes. Is there a reason that the uh, comp the the uh, I'm sorry the nonprofit didn't have equity in those companies? That seems I bet crazy. you, <laughs> I bet you, we're we're doing a pay it forward now program where uh, graduates can volunteer to give us uh, warrants, which is a future um, access to buy uh, stock at a set price in the beginning. Um, but yeah, well, that was a big big miss, big miss. <laughs> Great question. I wish we ran like a VC fund, but we didn't. <laughs> Other questions? All right, so we're going to hit raising capital first. We're going to go through types and sources. Then we're going to go into fundraising steps, capital accessibility, and differentiation. And I'm going to try to do this in 35 minutes, but I do want you all to raise your hands and ask questions along the way. All right, raising capital, types, sources, and options for businesses. We do have a quiz. If you think you know it, awesome. Go ahead and do it. It's on the Ed app. I see a couple of phones coming out. Um, and we do have a lot of online material <laughs> and videos from actual resources themselves, from banks, uh, from 
uh, private equity groups from VCs that we can absolutely share with you at any point in time. Now here's the punchline. There are three types of capital for businesses. First is non-dilutive, the next is dilutive, and the third is debt. Non-dilutive and dilutive is really positioned around ownership of your company. Uh, Non-dilutive means that you get cash by giving some sort of results or some sort of innovation share or impact. No repayment is expected on non-dilutive. If it's dilutive, that means there's an exchange of cash where you give up some of the ownership of your company. And the reason being is that the new owners want to increase the value of their stake from here to here and then sell and take that gap as their profit because they're putting their money to work by investing in your company. And debt, who here has a credit card? I am hoping everyone raises their hand <laughs> or a loan. Okay, so we all know how it works on our personal life. The same thing goes with businesses. But there are a lot of interesting debt structures when it comes to companies. Very quickly, here are some examples of non-dilutive uh, resources of capital. <clears throat> Grants and pitch competitions. You can enter a pitch competition. It's probably not even a fee. You're going to put in sweat equity to build out your pitch and to record that video and then go up on stage. Bam, you get a $25,000 check. You never need to pay that back. And you're getting that check because not only you're convincing as an individual and you stuck through it, but your innovation outranked all the other people that you were competing against. This is a wonderful source of non-dilutive. Now me, in the nonprofit world, we live, die, and breathe by grants. We have a grant writer. It's associated with universities. We do these long structured multi-year programs that have impact reports, etc. The amount of time and effort that goes through the grants are significant but they're usually in the seven figures. And so you just have to do a cost analysis and balance of like, what's the risk and do you have the right partnerships to hit these grants? Next are dilutive. Dilutive is basically Shark Tank. Everybody heard, watched, adore, adore Shark Tank? Yes. Okay, so um, this is done through crowdfunding um, or direct investment through a price round or safe agreements Basically, you're bringing on shareholders. And then debt, unfortunately, most people start off with their personal line of credit for businesses, which isn't really a great long-term strategy, but it's just what you need to do to survive. But eventually, you'll roll into creating a corporate account, corporate credit, and then there's also revenue-based financing, or RBF, which is very, very popular, especially because interest rates and the cost of money is high today. A couple of years ago, completely different story. Oops, wrong way. All right, let's dive into equity. Can anybody tell me um, if they have heard or seen this sort of sequence before of like pre-seed, seed, series A, B, C, and late stage or exit? Okay, awesome. So these are the way that we rank not only the maturity of the deal, but the maturity of the business. And the earlier the deals are, the riskier it is, yet the higher return the investors have. So investors in the top category of pre-seed, which can be your friends and family, it can be angel investors, um, it can be incubators and accelerators, they're looking for insanely high returns. Uh, basically, 40x is what you'll commonly hear at that sort of level. But late stage, they're really happy if it's 5x, right? And it's because they think all of the risk is mitigated. It's just more of a when, not if. Now, equity, <laughs> the way you get this to work is by proving a valuation of your company or basically a worth a dollar amount that your company is. And you'll be in finance and classes, et cetera, that'll go into this. But basically, you look at all of your assets, including your IP, you look at your historical sales, your revenue, as well as your forecast, and you come up with a valuation that's on par with the market. And the more accurate the valuation is, 
the less that you can give up or know what you're negotiating when it comes to equity-based investments. Oftentimes I'm asked, hey Tar, can I get equity on an idea? And the answer is absolutely, you can, you can get capital for equity at any business stage, but at what cost is what I like to ask about. And the less traction and the less validation your idea and business model have, then the more you're going to give up. Some people love to say like, oh, I'm doing a startup. Well, actually, startup is pretty mature. Most people are here in this pre-startup and in this pre-seed round. If you have no or little revenue, yep, you're pre-startup. If you're just validating the market needs by doing the surveys, which you're probably learning a lot about here in your business courses, that's awesome. And you're gonna fall into what's called a safe agreement because you don't have a hard valuation for your company yet since it's still just kind of amorphic. And we'll go into a safe agreement very next. Now, some are now merging to convertible notes, which are actually structured like a loan. So it's a safe agreement with an interest rate and with also a date attached to it. And then as you move to a startup where you have the product market fit, like you have a product, people are buying it, you're hiring people, <clears throat> your product is formalized and you're working on distribution, um, that's the true startup. And this is where you start to figure out your sort of margins and profitability. And this is where you're not as much leaning on safe agreements because as we mentioned before, the more true your validation is, uh, then your valuation follows. And then last, my favorite place is the scale. And this is all about optimization and growth. Investments in equity can be for sales, distribution advancement, product category extension, or new market entries. And this is where there's fixed rounds or traditional equity um, will happen. So questions about the maturity and how equity is available, but it's just kind of structured different before we move on. Uh, can you skip any of these steps? Like, because a lot of, like, I guess tech companies would kind of go from pre-startup or startup even, and then overnight they hit scale. So you're, you're actually hitting on a point when it comes to momentum. But the trick is, is even if you go for a loan, you're still going to have to do this. And I'm glad you brought this up. You can skip it if you're well prepared, and we're going to get to that. Okay. Other questions? Okay, so just to recap, there's three types of agreements that are standard for equity-based uh, capital raises. We talked about safe, simple agreement for future equity. And like I was saying, you're pushing out the timeline of setting a true valuation for your company. Convertible note is just like a safe, but it's structured like a loan, so there's an interest rate and a date that you have to either convert into equity or pay it back. And then this traditional equity or the price round is when you actually set the valuation, when you get a certain amount of money in, it equals a certain percent percentage of ownership. Questions on these three? Okay. All right, so debt we are gonna um, just pay little attention to. My advice on debt is to know how and when the cash will be used to ensure the return is more than the amount borrowed plus the interest. Very simple principle. And as you all know, our interest rate, there's no sign at this point of coming down in the next quartile. So we have to make sure that if you do debt-based equity, that there's some sort of profit that not only repays the loan amount, but also the interest due as well. One of the things that <clears throat> are now becoming really popular, revenue-based financing. And I'm not going to go into it, but there's six subcategories underneath where there's also a possibility of an exchange of ownership or equity as a sub-tier uh, to a loan structure, et cetera, and as well as future revenue. So revenue-based financing is for a little bit more of a mature company. So you have, like for example, selling products and customers in the pipeline. But let's say you don't have the cash 
to build up the supply or to get it distributed. That's when revenue-based financing comes in. Uh, Utah has been a hotbed, uh, especially over this past year for revenue-based financing. And there's three new groups that have just recently come into here uh, to help companies out because frankly, it was under-resourced. And so if you have any questions or would like to know more about that, happy to chat with you afterwards. And then my favorite, non-dilutive, we talked about pitch competitions and grants, but the one that I didn't mention earlier are sales and LOIs, our letter of intents. And sales and LOIs are the best because it's not only improving the valuation of your company or the worth of your company, but all you have to do is you never have to give the cash back. You just have to give the product and the value promised. It also helps with um, confirming your ICP or ideal customer profile. It confirms the product market fit and it helps with packaging and distribution and strengthening your ecosystem as a business. This is how you make things scalable. All right, any questions before we go into fundraising steps? You guys are so quiet. There's 120 of you. <laughs> Have you ever heard of that stuff before? No, okay, I'm seeing a no. Heard of debt, you know debt. We know debt. <laughs> but debt can be structured very interestingly. And um, I've seen promissory notes structured as debt. Uh, anybody know what a promissory note is? Okay, it's, it's a private loan with a non-FDIC bank. So grandpa could do a structured promissory note, okay? Yes. So with interest rates being so high, where do you think, because I know seller financing is kicking up a lot as far as real estate goes, but in terms of like investing, how do you think that's going to play into a role? Okay, great question. So um, seller financing is what I would call a spiff, right? It's not going to get the deal done. Either it's going to be investable in a loan or not. I think businesses are looked at at the very same. There are private bankers or broker dealers when it comes to the corporate financing world that will offer spiffs. And they're structured kind of the same. And so you want to pay attention to those sorts of things. I think anybody who is taking outside money now knows it's expensive, especially compared to 18, 24 months ago. And so going back to my debt point, only take what you need and make sure that you're applying it and will get a return on that debt that will cover the spread as well as the interest. And so it really comes down to really sound business planning and you taking a look at your internal risk for the such. My attitude right now is there's a lot of still free money out there. Uh, at a federal level, at a state level, go after the free money. Because right now, you're either gonna give up a lot of equity compared to two years ago, or take on a much higher interest rate compared to two years ago. So my whole thing is like pitch competitions, grants, etc. Like there is a ton of money. Separately, after the next round of election, I think the free money is gonna dry up. How many of you have heard about our national deficit? Are you concerned? Um, really? <laughs> Does anybody know when Social Security is supposed to run out? In 11 years. 11 years, folks. So how do you think they're gonna start making up for that? They're gonna take away the free money next year. So what that means, get off your tatukas, start Googling, start filling out the forms, get going on that free money before it evaporates. Hopefully by then, our interest rates will settle down. Uh, I don't know if the pendulum is gonna swing as far as it was on being so like pro-entrepreneur. But like, if you pay attention to what's going on in the US politics, as well as the US markets, you can get a sense as to what's available in small business. It's crazy. Is that for me? Joking. <laughs> All right, so there's five stages of fundraising. Going back to your question, can you cut? The answer is not really, because you can really hurt yourself. But you can move quickly. If you're very smart at doing viability preparation, just knowing your analysis, having your ducks in a row with your go-to-market strategy, having the sort of endorsements, 
and then quickly and properly forming your company, doing the incorporation, having HR, having the agreements, your bank account, your EIN, taxes, et cetera, et cetera. Then you can get into the fundraising plan and pitch and post-close activities very, very quickly. Fundraising plan we're going to go into in a second, but know your investment ask, be it debt, equity, or non-dilutive, and why. Also be familiar with the different types of agreements that are popular right now and at what terms. Plus, always, always, always have a pitch deck and it will always, always, always change. Just get used to it. That's just life. Never, no pitch deck ever remains the same. Also, if you can, do a demo video. Have samples. Uh, allow people to fall in love with your product because this is the best way to support a capital provider and get them excited. And then also know your profile of a capital provider. We were talking about for pre-seed level, angel investors are fabulous. Don't hit VCs right out of the gate if you're at the pre-seed unless you've already closed and sold a few companies already and you have that relationship. Now when it comes to capital provider pitch, you're gonna have to do a lot of work and it's another full-time job on doing the provider meetings and KYC AML, the KYC is know your customer, AML is anti-money laundering. It is our responsibility as US citizens and by managed by the SEC that we do everything above the board and report it. Also, get ready for agreement negotiations. Um, you will get some hostile terms. Um, you will also get people that don't mean it for it to be hostile, they're just uh, inexperienced. And then you'll go through the purchase agreement and the transfer of funds. And then after that, it doesn't mean you're in the clear. You need to then start building a relationship with your capital provider by giving them periodic updates, by possibly in pulling them onto your board, uh, by doing like quarterly communications so like, hey, here's what's up with my company. Okay? So those are the five steps. Any questions? Yes? When you talk about pulling someone onto your board, that's really common with venture how, how common is that with like, angel investors? Angel investors, it's not. But you know what they often become? Advisors. And advisors can also be paid incentive by owning like another half point of stock, et cetera. So you can get creative on that as well if you can't pay for them. Great question. And you had a question. Um, does this work the same for services rather than products? Yes, absolutely. A business is a business is a business is a business. You have to understand how to get access to capital. Her question was, because she's so right up front, and I'm not sure if y'all can hear this, does this work for services as well as for products? And the answer is 100% yes. It works for me as a nonprofit. Like, people are investing in me, and I'm like, breaking even. Like, that's how it works. Go ahead. Okay, also with the product market fit, when you're, in, when you're doing like seed investing and pre-seed investing, how, how do you demonstrate what, what have been some creative ways that you've seen that demonstrated? Yeah, so product market fit can go from like esoterical to actual sales. And it can also be demonstrated by supply chain, uh, by integration points, etc. So esoterical can be market surveys, right? It could be chat groups on whatever app, right? Uh, you can have like quantitative and qualitative research. Other products are samples, um, et cetera. So there's just various sort of traction points that you can prove which mitigate the risk that one, you know who's gonna buy it, and two, you know the value that they get out of it, okay? So in your experience, where do you think most of these businesses, because a lot of them end up failing, yeah. especially startups, where do you think that failure point is? As far as like on that graph. Okay, 80% of businesses who failed in 2021, this is 2022 data, uh, said access to capital was their problem. And now, if we dig a little deeper, because I've worked with over like a thousand companies over the course of my lifetime, I think it's misappropriation of funds and poor financial planning uh, that had them like burning inefficiently. Uh, that got a little too trendy or a little too naive as to what true costs were. Oftentimes, I tell entrepreneurs, pick the lowest hanging fruit for a reason and execute like heck until it is done. Don't give up. You can pivot 
but don't give up because there's so much investment on that low hanging fruit. Oftentimes I see entrepreneurs saying like, oh, I wanna do three things at once. It's impossible. In fact, it's almost impossible <laughs> getting capital and running a business. It's, it's, this is so insanely time consuming. Yo, okay. So how do you find the appropriate investors for your business ideas? I've tried in the past, and some companies, banks, credit unions, other things just don't finance into certain types of businesses. Um, then I've contacted <laughs> higher up corporations and stuff that require massive barriers to entry that don't allow for small startups. And so you're kind of stuck in this middle zone of there's no one on the bottom end who funds certain types of businesses and no one on the top end who will look at you until you've reached a certain milestone. So where do you find these secret investors? Yeah, and thank you for being honest because that is usually the access to capital problem that comes up. Um, there are organizations such as mine that offer these sorts of services for free. Our name is Connect Capital, and it's because we have an ecosystem of mentors and experts from various capital providers, and we know it's about the network. So how would you network your company then yeah. for people to find out that you exist when these, I mean, do you reach out to these credit unions and these banks and say, hey, if you get so-and-so who comes in who you can't provide for, we're here, how do you spread your name? Yeah, no, great question. So first off, uh, we have statewide groups like SDBC. That's kind of a, a small business development group. Uh, and what they do is they'll run through and say, you're going more this way versus that way. So we think you would apply to an SBA loan versus a line of credit. So I would say leverage as many free resources like my nonprofit, like these government entities to do an analysis on what their perception is but you better know, what is your investment ask? What is the use of funds? When do you think it's gonna return? And, and that whole aspect of your story has to be super, super tight. And if it's not tight, leverage resources to do that. Secondly, then it's going into, you know, creating that sort of target list, et cetera, and it's grueling. And if you go for an equity pitch, okay, for my company, that I started was bench pick, bench pick, I probably spoke to 80 investors and got a yes. 80. 79 no's, 79 really great talks and lunches, but you just gotta keep on hammering it. And so that's just the truth of why raising capital is really, really difficult. But the more you can get word out there, the more you expand your native network, and the more you understand what type of an agreement and capital provider is more apt for your business, the higher likelihood it was, because I was also like spraying and praying at the time, honestly, um, just pitching anybody that would respond back to my email. And then due diligence is also really important. Um, who has heard of due diligence? Okay, awesome. So now due diligence is all digital. It's so important because it avoids frictions and surprises. And I'd much rather get a quick no than a slow no. Like, don't waste my time. This is painful already. Um, here is the due diligence deal room. This is your responsibility as a CEO to orchestrate it. Do you need all of these buckets? No. <laughs> Probably doesn't apply depending on where your maturity is, if you have a service or a product or not, um, et cetera. But if you have your information digitally and it's ready to go in a secure area that in fact a true capital provider can access, then you're basically reducing friction for them to be confused or wait until they have time to review your information. The worst is to go back and forth. It's like approaching a yellow light, like just gun it. Um, and, and that's what your uh, deal room is. It's allowing you just to gun it without saying like, oh, I gotta slow down, I gotta find my HR documents or my, or my last year's tax documents. Okay, any questions before we get into accessibility which can further answer? How is this so far, okay? All right, so matching the fund use growth plan and profitability is super important. Um, I like to, okay, I've, 
gone through companies that have been through all walks of this, but I like a two by two sort of a grid. And if you can truly look at yourself and your business of like, where are we on growth and profitability, especially compared to other companies in our industry? Are we growing faster? Are we growing about the same? Or are we growing slower? Are we about as profitable? Or are we less as profitable? Or are we more profitable? By answering these sorts of questions, you can start looking, <coughs> especially from an equity standpoint. Now, there's a different graph for debt, which I didn't include on this presentation. But there's different sorts of ways that you can totally look at this. So if you're low profitability, but my gosh, you are figuring out that traction to your point earlier, convertible notes and safe agreements make sense because you're still not profitable, but everybody's picking up and you might be on that rocket ship. If you're low profitability, low growth, but it's still a viable business, look at grants, pitch competitions, crowdfunding. It's another really good resource. And I'm not saying crowdfunding to sell products. This is like Republic, for example. Um, where you're selling parts of your company to unaccredited investors. And that's totally legal. It's just a separate SEC filing. So would the crowdfunding also be like clients as well? Like yes. Like your product and all yes. Clients, you? So one of my friends, she, has, she owns M-Cycle. Uh, her name is Melissa. She got her financing through crowdfunding because banks said no. They're like, we're not going to invest. Torrent's like the best company, blah, blah, blah. And she's like, really? And she got all of her LA friends to buy a part of her company, and that's how she financed it. So with the more funding we get off the crowdfunding, do you think we'd have a higher chance of getting a bigger, because now we have more capital to grow, and also our balance sheets look better. Can we use that to kind of leverage and do bigger loans as well? Um, absolutely. So on loans, there's a debt to asset ratio um, that banks look at. Banks use a different model for evaluating um, than investors. And so like, first off, I always recommend like, pursue understanding finance yourself always. But then there are certified people. Uh, I, work, I have a CFO on my team. Um, our nonprofit offers fractional CFO introductions and they help out for free. Uh, it's really helpful to have people that know these ratios and have these sorts of access points to capital to explain what their expectations are. It also changes by industry uh, and that's just because of like overhead cost, materials, leeway, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, if you're in the high profitability but low growth debt, some, it makes oftentimes more sense as well as revenue-based financing, and then, of course, high growth, uh, high profitability. You know, these are the price rounds or traditional equity. Private equity investments where they'll buy, you know, 51% of your company. Um, it's like a strategic. And then IPOs, of course, or SPACs. Any questions on that? Go ahead. I, I can't expect anything anymore because like, I've seen so many weird things. Um, I've also seen companies uh, support their product inf innovation with a service play, which is also really smart uh, because they're not dipping into debt uh, where they just want to control more of their company and keep the relationship with their prospective clients tight. There's so many variances out there. I don't want to make a sweeping statement. Go ahead, I saw another hand up. Or maybe I didn't. Maybe, maybe not. All right. So equity capital sources by stage. Um, one more time, early friends and family, angel investors, pre-accelerators. Uh, early startup angel groups, super angels, uh, syndicators. Has anybody heard of SPVs or syndication? Okay, so this is a way to basically uh, democratize investment rounds. Um, 99 investors can jump into a single sing syndication and just show up as one line on your cap table. Uh, but they all write small checks, like $5,000. Uh, uh, one of my dear friends led the biggest syndicators here in Utah. His name is Landon Ainge. 
Uh, a new one that just popped up is ran by Luke Gunderson called Beehive VC in their syndicator. It's just like $5,000 checks, but you, when you get 50 of them, it all of a sudden makes a massive difference. Also, there's a lot of micro funds in early stage VCs, as well as strategic investors and venture studios. And venture studios are super fun. Um, now they're on the acquisition spree for distressed companies, and they're looking for new startup ideas like yours to blend with old companies that didn't fit perfectly well, okay? And then uh, scale and exit, we have VCs, strategic investors, all the way to SPACs and IPOs. Don't forget, <laughs> whenever you have a capital provider sitting on the other side of your table, keep in mind what they want, which is their money back and then some. Okay, folks, you don't get their money. You got to think about that endpoint as to when you return it and then some handsomely. This is how they put their money to work. Any questions before I move on to differentiation? Okay, I've got five more minutes on this and then we can do Q&A. Is that okay, Tyler? Okay. Other question I'm asked a lot is like, am I invisible? Oh my gosh. Ah. And the answer is yes. But going back to what I said at the very beginning, at what cost? The first thing that you need to think about is the investor's perspective. You know, investor starts off with you at 100% risk. They may not know you. They may have gotten a weird email or like a handshake introduction from someone they haven't talked to in seven months you are definitely classified as a super high risk. And they're gonna slap your valuation down because the more riskier it is, the more likely you are, to your point, going out of business or not being a true opportunity for returning. So what you need to do is over time, just prove out your traction, which then in fact associates an improvement in your valuation. So just really think of communicating these success points and reducing the risk through traction and sales. Um, everybody is investable. There is something <laughs> that you won't hear much of, but it's something that I've observed, which is called the innovation intrigue. Investors are probably investors because they probably made their money by originally being in your seat. And they figured something out. But the question is, is what category were they in? Because not only do they have the experience, but they still have the appeal, the zeal, and the hype about. And so it's fine if you're at any point of these innovation spectrum or and the value deliverable, you still can return a lucrative, lucrative profitability to them. But you have to know the game before you. And so very, very serious. If you're in a fad or a service, it's easily repeatable, right? People can replicate what you're doing. There may not be that much innovation, but there's a secret behind this that is insanely profitable. Also, if you have high innovation, but it's just low value, that means you're probably tailing someone else's innovation. And you're probably extending like their feature set or it's some sort of add-on extension obviously filling a gap. But how do you make this appealing to those sorts of capital providers? Now, of course, if you're high value but low innovation, this is the bucket that I actually made a ton of money in, and I call it the amalgamation bucket. And I amalgamated a ton of open source products together, did a really simple dashboard, and voila, sold it for 49 bucks, and it went global. So. I didn't write the code. I just basically stitched the code together. And it was brilliant because it was in basically monitoring networks. That's it. Very, very simple. It's a stagnant market. Still had a massive need and demand. And they made Google a lot of money because they invested in us. And then this one is where everybody wants to play, but it's really tricky to get into because you're creating an ecosystem. You're creating a platform. You're creating a new disruptive just paradigm altogether. But let me tell you how you sell. This is the big deal. So if you're in the high value, low innovation, really focus on your cleverness and really focus on optimizing that go-to-market 
aptitude and, and strategy. How did I do it in network monitoring? Well, I started off with my open source people and the people who complained in the chat rooms that the open source was just too admin-y. No better than someone like me, <laughs> who's terrible at IT, to come in and say, wouldn't you like a dashboard, right? And that's how we sold that. That's how we built trust. Now, if you're low innovation and low value, guess what? Your lifespan might be short, but you'd be insanely lucrative. I think about all of the toys I've bought my kids, like those poppy things and the weird pillow, now Halloween costumes. Like, oh my gosh, they're probably 50 cents they made, and I'm like at 40 bucks. Anyways, short lifespan. We won't see these costumes again for, you know, next Halloween. But yet, it's highly profitable. And so people that are playing in this quadrant, you better know your internal books and optimize and manage your costs of goods sold as well as your internal operations so that your bottom line looks super juicy. Penetrate or go to market as quickly as possible because the next fad, the next wave is right on your heels and it's gonna sneak up faster. And make sure <clears throat> you capitalize on impulse. Now, if you're in this high innovation and low value, you are tailing a leader. Play nice with this leader. Uh, when I was at Sugar CRM, we decided not to play nice with Salesforce.com. I'm not sure if that was the right move to do, in all honesty, because they were the leader and we just didn't play nice with them. In fact, we liked to pick on them. We did the David and Goliath skit very, very well. But, other companies that tail the leader, like, ah, we're part of the, the Red Hat community or Novell, they get into the price books, they keep the, the SLAs or the service level agreements up to date, et cetera. Look, it gets very, very juicy because an immediate slosh of customers are ready to go. And so this is all about frictionless sell, and this too is very, very lucrative. This is an investor that's different than the other two. And then the last is the high value, high innovation, thought leader. You're creating new habits. You're disrupting and building massive ecosystems. And you're opening many revenue generating opportunities. Okay, out of these four quadrants, where do you think VCs play? We'll go one, two, three, four. Hold up your hand. We got a couple of fours. We got a one, two. Yeah, Okay, it's actually four. VCs want to play here. So, well done. And that's how come it's, they'll always listen to pitches because they always want to know what everybody's thinking and wanting to disrupt. But it's very, very hard because their return, they're basically managed by a fund and their fund only on average returns like 2.7, 2.8 of the investment to their LPs. VCs know that eight out of 10 of their investment totally strike out or just wash even. It's the two out of 10 that will be between 40 and 100 uh, times return. And that's how they compensate. So this is a business model in itself, as well as the VC's ego of being like, I was part of the Tesla group on investment. And that's honestly how it works. All right, so again, investor's perspective, payback. How much will we return back to the investor? How long will it take? Know that payback time, growth rate. What's your growth plan and timeline? It's okay if it's short, it's okay if it's long, it's okay if it's like this or like this. Just be straight up. And then the risk. Be honest about the risk without it being like petrifying. They know it if they're used to the quadrant. They know it, trust me. They started in your seat, I guarantee that. And that is it, folks. Any questions? So where would you say BlackRock would be? Venture capitalists? Like, the private equity. Okay. Because they use a lot of like information through their own companies, right? Like Facebook, you know, and then they find, well, you know, people are searching up this term a lot. And they also have funds of funds. Yeah. Uh, it's a, <clears throat> if you get into the arbitrage, 
um, fund management, private equity, uh, hedge, hedge funds. It's, it's a completely different game and oftentimes that's in the scale package. They're not looking at us pre-startup and startup groups, honestly. If they are, it's because the investor, excuse me, the founder created a rocket ship or two beforehand. That's just how it works. It's who you know and what you've done. Oh, also, um, who you hire is very, very important. Go ahead. So say you have like a business that you could start up as a service, like low cost on your own, right? Like running it online, like sending out some, right? Yes. And you could use that to then generate capital to, like, to finance for your, your product that you want to like move into, to sort of like tie all together. Yes. What is like the benefit of getting investors or doing that versus just like sort of sticking it out until you can develop enough capital until you can make that move? I love this question. And I think this is part of the grassroots of true Utah entrepreneurs, which are in fact capital averse, outside capital averse. There is something about sweat equity to, build, to basically finance your, let's just be honest, lab experiments. And the more you finance when it comes to lab experiment, before you really know that this can scale or not, the better position you're in because you're not ratcheting down your ownership, nor are you taking on debt that has risk of not being paid back. It's called the lean startup model is another thing like that became popular here and written here, in fact, at like the turn of the century. Um, uh, I think it's a wonderful strategy, but then if you have a very solid outside financial officer that says you can apply what you built, but to a bigger model or to a bigger market, yet it requires capital so that you're well supported, the infrastructure is there, the marketing and sales are there, et cetera, you can expect this returns. That's called forecasting. And you can play forecasting models until you're blue in the face. They're free and it's a lot of fun. And then once you get it figured out and dialed, that's when you're like, okay, so here's my capital allocation plan. This is how I'm gonna figure out that the returns it's gonna make. This is how long it's gonna take to spend. This is what I think the risk is. And then the more you work with others to sell it, then that's how you transform a service-based company into a product innovator and a disruptor to scale it. Yeah. Great question. Thank you. And another fun part, you can sell your service company. And so that's another way you can finance. If you want to go all in on the innovation for scale, sell it. Why don't we take one more question? Sure. Go ahead. Um, so, did, did you go to college? I did. All right. Do you mind me asking where you went to school and what you majored in and how that potentially benefited your career? Oh, cool. Thanks. I went to the University of Colorado Buffalo. Yeah. Um, you were looking at the student president of the undergrads for B school, um, but I lost four times before I won and got it. So, there's this part of me just being adamant. And um, I really wanted to become a marketer. So I took amazing like marketing classes, <laughs> wound up in sales, eventually I got pulled into marketing and they told me I sucked. They were like, oh my God, you're so bad. So then I taught myself how to code because I'm just stubborn and uh, built the company's very first website. I saved them a million bucks and that changed my trajectory from being a really bad marketer <laughs> to coding. And so that's how I got into like the whole open source thing is I learned how to code after school because it was a passion. So, oh, no, go ahead. Uh, so, like, would you say your big jumps in your career started in like the Silicon Valley? Because I'm actually from Cupertino. Yeah. All my friends are trying to do that right now. Um, and is there any advice you would have for like a Silicon Valley entrepreneur versus a Utah entrepreneur? Yeah, and okay, so he's asking a really important question, which is basically geographic related um, influences when it comes to business creation. And that is absolutely the truth. When I moved to Utah from uh, Silicon Valley, I was like, whoa, because there are no resources out here. 
And so it requires a much more lean approach because it's not easy to fundraise. And there is a FOMO component when it comes to especially, especially capital accessibility. Out here, there's so much stuff that's like government and school supported versus out there, which is just basically um, private institution like VC groups, as well as like alumni from other schools. Uh, as you know, like if you're Stanford, you're not going to a Berkeley person to ask for money. Like it's super weird out there. Very competitive, it's different. So the cool thing about this state, and this is, so I'm a mom, I have a senior in high school, I'm telling her to apply to SUU, she won't listen to me because I'm her mom. But um, you know, the cool thing about here is that this is a community and it's a beehive state. And like, we don't look at each other as competitive because there's so much green field. And I think that's what makes Utah amazing as well as undervalued. I just last week hosted a conference for women entrepreneurs. We graduated 16 female CEOs who are raising about $10 million in funding right now. And they pitched to, well, we had like 300 attendees, so a bunch. And um, the, the thing is, is that everybody works together. It's not like you're gonna invest in her and not her. It's, it's, a, it's a totally different sort of paradigm out here, which I think you guys are really lucky. Separately, we had a lot of investors come from uh, New York and California to look at our pitches, and they're like, they're only valued at this? I'm like, yeah, we're not, a, we're not a coastal company, we're not a coastal state. Like, we actually have our heads on her when it comes to company valuation, which is one of the main drivers of investment. Hope that's helpful. Y'all are in a good place, honestly. Very good place. Thank you.